For those of you that uh, came in while John was performing, I'm John Eicher. I'm a JFAN board member and your NC for this uh, annual meeting of the Jefferson County Farmers and Neighbors. We're going to begin tonight's formal program with a, a short clip from an upcoming documentary film with the title of Right to Harm. The film is a product of Hourglass Films and it will be released in early 2019. The basic premise of the film is that while states' so-called right to farm laws may give uh, agricultural producers the, the legal right to pollute the air with agrochemicals and biological waste, farmers do not have an ethical right to farm in ways that harm their neighbors or anyone else. This particular clip focuses on the work of JFAN and Iowa. But the full-length documentary includes stories of people and communities affected by PFOS all across the country, I think in five different states. I think you'll probably see, many of you'll see some uh, familiar faces in this short clip that we'll show you tonight. So we'll show the, show the video, please. I chose to move to Fairfield, Iowa because it was a small community, but I live in town. I wouldn't move anywhere outside of a town limit because of the fear that a CAFO would come in and locate close to me. That's what we've done to the culture out here. I helped create this thing that's now threatening everything that I set out to help protect. And that's one reason I continue to do what I'm doing. These corporations are turning traditional family farmers' right to farm into a corporate right to harm, a right to pollute the air and the water with potentially toxic chemical and biological waste. It's time to break the corporate agriculture's grip on rural Iowa. <laughs> Corporations are trying to divide us because the only power greater than corporate power is the power of the people. The change in state and federal regulations with respect to CAFOs is going to have to come from people at the local level. In Iowa and across the state lines, local communities are standing up and taking their future in their own hands, just like John talked about a moment ago. In Wayne County, Iowa Select Iowa's largest hog corporation proposed a 7,500 head sow operation. It's huge. The community was outraged. Public meetings, calls, emails, letters to the editor. The result? Iowa Select pulled out. Feel your power and be powerful. Let's work together to implement a factory farm moratorium now. We can all do this. Thank you. In 1995, the state legislature decided that we had to have a one-size-fits-all way of regulating CAFOs in the state, and they took away local control. After that happened, the number of CAFOs really started to climb significantly. <laughs> Today in Iowa, we have about 23 million hogs. We have about 69 million eggling chickens and about 3 million cattle in feedlots. really clamoring for changes. A lot of change. For me, it's about social justice. You can get a situation like this, where you've got a home and a CAFO was built in 174 feet away from that home. It's about the unfairness of a system that's pushed down the throats of communities. Can it be the corporation that buys and provides the hogs? You can have a cable built by the corporation. So everything is like integrated within one company. I do a lot of community education. This is the AI 
AFO database, this is where you want to find out where CAFOs are located. We need to have a community that's educated and knowledgeable. They're an empowered community. It's up to the CAFO owner to follow the rules, and it's up to all of us to make sure that they do. In 2002, there was a backlash from people angry that local control was taken away. If you go into the appendix, you'll see a master matrix. A dozen people, sometimes called the Gang of Twelve, created this master matrix, and it was not an easy process. So the master matrix is an application that consists of 44 questions, and it's based on a point system. Anybody that is building a CAFO that's 2,500 hogs or greater has to fill this out in the counties that adopt the master matrix. Typically, 88 out of the 99 counties do. If the county says, we don't think you have enough points to pass, the DNR can basically overturn what the county says. I really want to thank you all for coming out tonight. This is an important meeting, and it just shows that Jefferson County residents really care about what's going on in our county right now. 22 counties have come out to say they want either revisions to the master matrix, or some of them are even calling for a factory farm moratorium. I'm now going to turn this over to Senator David Johnson, and I'm really pleased to introduce him. There aren't too many people working on this at the state level, but one person that is is Senator David Johnson. I went up here. What they're really concerned about is that this is a tourism county. He has spent the last couple of years traveling the state, meeting with communities, and it's really moved him. The number of CAFOs here uh, is on the rapid increase. They have three times as many as there were 15 years ago. For someone who was raised in an agricultural family. I brought that perspective uh, to the 12-member special committee that, that set up the, the current law. Makes me feel I have responsibility to the entire state. Somebody had come and bought up a bunch of parcels of land, decided that they wanted to put cables on those. But the problem is it's in the watershed of the community. It's come to the point where people call me from all over the state and say they see an issue. The only entity that can change the master matrix is the legislature, and pigs give campaign contributions. I'm convinced that nothing's gonna change, so we need to change out some people. It's all about people, folks. How about that, huh? We at GFAN, we're looking forward to the official release of the Right to Harm documentary in early 2019. And we promise you a public showing in Fairfield, and the filmmakers have promised to be here for that. As I indicated previously, the documentary isn't just about JFAN and Iowa. It includes stories of people in communities affected by CAFOs all across the country. CAFO strongly support, uh, JFAN strongly supports the basic premise of this film, and that premise is that the economic rights of CAFO operators cannot be allowed to take priority over the basic human rights of the people that they affect. And CAFO... And JFAN will continue to help those who choose to defend their property values, their physical health, and their quality of life against the scientifically documented threats of CAFOs. That being said, the program this evening will focus primarily on alternatives to CAFOs rather than the threats. We frequently hear promoters of CAFOs say that there are no viable alternatives to CAFOs. That is simply not true. JFAN is an educational organization, and we work to expose this and other myths about CAFOs. First, I want to expose the myth that we must accept CAFOs in Jefferson County because CAFOs are essential to the future of agriculture in the county and to the viability of the overall economy of Iowa. These and many other commonly held beliefs about CAFOs are simply not true. 
Now, while agriculture is certainly important to the Iowa economy, it is simply not true that Iowa's economy is dependent upon CAFOs. In fact, Iowa agriculture in total accounts for only about 5% of the state's total economy or SDP. And even if the agribusiness sector is included, including fertilizer, agrochemicals, meatpacking, farm machinery, and all, the agriculture-related activities account for only about one-fourth of Iowa's economy and one-tenth of the income of Iowans. Crop and livestock producers contribute roughly equal amounts to the economy, and livestock operations in Iowa certainly are not all capos. So it's simply not true. It's not true that the Iowa economy would suffer significantly if we had a statewide moratorium that was placed on new and expanding CAFOs in Iowa, which is a proposition JFAM strongly supports. CAFOs are even less important to Jefferson County than to the state. Agriculture and agribusiness in total makes up less than one-sixth of the county economy and provides only one-eighth of the county's employment. Livestock production accounts for only about 3% of the county's economy and a similar percentage of county employment. In addition, CAFO operators make up a small minority of the farmers in this county. There were 685 farmers in Jefferson County in the last census of agriculture. Only 48 of these 685 farmers are known operators of CAFOs. So only about one of every 14 farmers in Jefferson County is a CAFO operator. When people claim that CAFOs are essential to the future of agriculture in this county, it is simply not true. JFAN cares about the future of farming in Jefferson County, and one way we're trying to help ensure that future is to encourage the development of viable alternatives to CAFOs. That's what tonight's program is about. Our keynote presentation tonight and the panel discussion that follows feature farmers who are developing economically viable alternatives to CAFOs. These are alternatives that respect the basic rights of people to clean air, clean water, and safe, nutritious food. Organic, free-range, pasture-based, humanely raised, hormone antibiotic-free, GMO-free. These are all terms associated with resilient, regenerative, responsible alternatives to CAFOs. Whatever the CAFO promoters tell you that customers aren't concerned about anything except price and convenience, that is simply not true. Our Jefferson County supervisors tell us that Iowa state laws prevent them from doing anything to regulate or discourage CAFOs, even if they wanted to. Again, that's simply not true. Admittedly, Iowa law prohibits counties from enacting legislation to regulate CAFOs and also exempts agriculture from county zoning regulation. However, Iowa's so-called right to farm law states, and I quote, it is the intent of the General Assembly to provide for the orderly use and development of land and related natural resources in Iowa, to protect fragile ecosystems including forests, wetlands, rivers, streams, lakes, aquifers, prairie, and wildlife habitat, to protect soil from erosion and preserve the availability and use of land for agricultural production through processes that emphasize the participation of citizens and local governments. It continues, this may be accomplished by the creation of land use policies and establishment of agricultural land preservation areas so that land inside these areas is conserved for the production of food, fiber, livestock, thus assuring the preservation of agriculture as a major factor in the economy of this state. Now this legislation obviously assumed that agriculture is incompatible with protection of fragile natural ecosystems, including wetlands, rivers, streams, lakes, and aquifers. However, all of these concerns are addressed by socially and ecologically responsible agricultural alternatives to CAFOs. This law actually encourages local governments and citizens to establish agricultural preservation areas where socially and ecologically responsible alternatives to CAFOs could be supported and encouraged. CAFOs could, could not be regulated in such areas, but they could certainly be discouraged. It 
will be impossible to preserve the agri agriculture as a major sector of the economy of any county that opens the door and welcomes CAFOs to its communities. When county supervisors tell you there is nothing they can do about CAFOs, it is simply not true. Finally, JFAN is sometimes accused of being too negative, of being against farming or agriculture, at least against animal agriculture. Again, that's simply not true. We are more than willing to work with farmers, agricultural leaders, local government officials, and anyone who is willing to explore alternatives that respect the basic rights of the people of Jefferson County to clean air, clean water, and safe, nutritious food. However, when we are told that there are no viable alternatives to CAFOs, we hope that the rest of tonight's program will convince you to agree with us that that is simply not true. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Next, I, I want to introduce the President and Executive Director of JFAM, Diane Rosenberg. Now, everyone on the JFAM board, many people in Fairfield community know that Diane not only provides leadership for JFAM, but also that no one is more dedicated or works harder day after day to protect Jefferson County from the threat of factory farms than Diane. She also works as a consultant for the Social Responsible Agriculture Project, which carries out work similar to JFAN on the national level. Diane has a background in writing and publications and event promotion and community organizing, and all of this supports her work with JFAN. So please welcome Diane Rosenberg to remind us that what we do every day is important. Thank you. I came across a quote by Jane Goodall the other day that I thought very apropos to share with you tonight. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. All of us sitting here tonight are sitting here tonight because we want to make a difference. We may be here because we want to hear and support all the exciting things that are going on in the world of regenerative agriculture. Perhaps we're here because of concerns about CAFOs and we want to learn more about what we can all do. You are all making a difference just by being here tonight sending a very clear message to the corporate pork industry that you don't want more CAFOs in Jefferson County. I especially want to tell you tonight that you and many others are making a difference for Jefferson County. The JFAN board believes that several years ago, Jefferson County was targeted for CAFO expansion, just like what we've seen in neighboring Washington and Keokuk counties. But because members of the community stood up and said, not on our watch, now I'm echoing Mary Ann Williamson here, we've held down the number of CAFOs in the county to quite a great degree. Now this summer we had three CAFOs come into Jefferson County that got a lot of attention. Every year we do get some. It's inevitable, it's Iowa. The land with the welcome mat for CAFO development. Often when a CAFO is proposed in Jefferson County, one or two concerned neighbors may initially contact JFIN, but a community group often doesn't form to oppose it. These CAFOs are typically built in locations where there are fewer residents and little opposition. I like to think it's because the CAFO operators are picking sites using some of the principles in the JFIN Good Neighbor Guidelines. This year, something was different. This year, people came out in force, stood up and spoke out loudly 
about three CAFOs that were proposed. South of town, a community group immediately formed to address the Mike Keller CAFO. They held meetings, developed strategies, met with, with Keller himself several times, and they're looking into legal remedies should it prove to be a nuisance. Jefferson County residents packed the courtroom doing a master matrix public hearing for Mark Reiner's expansion five miles north of Fairfield. The supervisor's office was filled with concerned residents during both master matrix scoring sessions. And the response to the 7,500 head Huber CAFO was enormous. Emails, letters, phone calls, letters to the editor, more than I've ever seen on one topic, sent to both Bill Huber and the Jefferson County Board of Supervisors, who I have to say greatly disappointed us with their approach to this CAFO. 300 people turned out to an emergency meeting and hundreds of public comments, postcards, and petition signatures were collected and sent to Bill Huber and Jefferson County supervisors. Everyone who was engaged in these fights are making a difference for Jefferson County. All of you deserve a warm round of applause for all your efforts to stand up, speak out, and say not on our watch. Now, you may be thinking, did we really accomplish anything? After all, these CAFOs are moving forward. Well, I say yes, and this is why. Now, remember when I said every year Jefferson County gets some CAFOs? Well, despite all the attention these three high-profile high profile CAFOs received this summer, we actually had fewer factory farms proposed this year than in previous years. And that's a fact. Some people feel we're becoming inundated. We're not. Jefferson County does a lot better than many other counties in the state. CAFOs tend to be built where there is little opposition. When one is proposed and neighbors don't respond, CAFO owners may take that for a green light and keep moving forward with more in that area. I have seen that happen time and again. But in communities where people rise up, something different takes place. Like in Des Moines County. In 2014, Bill Huber and AgroAid Partners built six CAFOs at one time. The community said, not on our watch, and immediately formed a community group. When they couldn't stop the confinements, they pursued legal action when the CAFOs inevitably became a nuisance. They continued to monitor for new CAFOs. They've got a rep for doing that. The result, AgriWay Partners has steered clear of this neighborhood even in the midst of their expansion efforts. Same thing in Wayne County as you heard up here before. The community rose up decisively, stopped a 7,500 head Iowa Select sow operation, and Iowa Select stayed away from their neighborhood, even in the midst of their massive expansion efforts. I truly believe that Bill Huber was not expecting nor not prepared for the enormous response he received when he proposed a confinement in a sparsely populated area of the county where many CAFOs already exist. I truly believe he will think twice before he considers Jefferson County again, as may other CAFO operators. Last year, 1,300 and more, Jefferson County residents stood up firmly and told Jefferson County supervisors, we want a factory farm moratorium resolution. Even though the supervisors once again disappointed us, you all certainly didn't. Your efforts shouted loudly and clearly that Jefferson County is not a place where infringing CAFOs are welcome. And that very well may be why we had less CAFOs this year than in previous years. And no, I don't think this is a result of the trade wars, because the industry is still expanding, and the impacts of the tariffs will more likely be felt next year. All this kind of activity helps to create a deterrent for unfettered CAFO development in Jefferson County, where we have a fraction of the number of CAFOs that Washington and Keokuk counties do. 
I want to tell you just a few more ways that you and others around the state are making a difference. <clears throat> Last year at this time, we had 17 counties that either passed resolutions or wrote letters calling for a moratorium or revised master matrix. Today, I'm happy to say that we have now have 23 counties and that number is growing. This is because people are speaking out around the state and demanding change. Even better, during this year's legislative session, we had a bill calling for a factory farm moratorium introduced by Senator David Johnson, along with 14 other bills to fill, fix loopholes in CAFO regulations. This happened because the demand for change grows louder around the state, here in Jefferson County, every day. And Senator Johnson wanted to make a difference for all the people he saw suffering around the state. Now, that bill might not have gotten very far at the State House, but let me tell you, around the state it generated a lot of public attention on the moratorium. The press covered it. Two gubernatorial candidates made it a part of their campaign, and several members of the House co-sponsored the House version. We are confident the bill will be introduced again this year in the House, and possibly in the Senate, despite Senator Johnson's retirement from public office. People are also making a difference in the court system. Now that the Supreme Court has ruled on the challenge to the right to farm law, the bottom line, nothing much has changed. Attorney David Sykes and his litigation associates in Des Moines are moving forward with six cases and others are being considered for future litigation. These cases shine a spotlight on CAFO issues and the rights that Iowans should have to the peaceful enjoyment of their homes. You too are an instrument of change when you speak out against infringing CAFOs in your neighborhoods and around the county. You too can make a difference by making food choices produced with regenerative agricultural practices, not CAFOs. You can be an instrument of change by lobbying for better laws with calls, emails, and trips to Des Moines, urging your state legislators to support a factory farm moratorium and other essential regulatory changes. You can make a difference by learning the positions and track records of all the candidates and elected officials and getting out to vote on November 6th. Your vote does make a difference. to the polls too. Their vote makes a difference too. We deserve a better agricultural system. And we deserve a factory farm moratorium until farmers like those we're going to hear from tonight are the rule rather than the exception. We can all be part of making that change happen. Join me in doing all you can to make a difference for yourselves, your families, and for the future generations of Jefferson County and Iowa. Remember, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Thank you. Okay, next on our program tonight is Dean Dresden. Dean's a JFAN board member and he's the president and CEO of Dean Dresden Communications, which many of you know is a successful PR firm based here in Fairfield. Among his many clients are uh, Alan Dersowitz and J.D. Vance, who wrote the New York Times bestseller, Hillbilly Allergy, which I can tell you as a confirmed hillbilly was a very good book. So, <laughs> Please welcome Dean, who reminds us of why now more than ever we need to support JFAM. Here's a hypothetical. 
Let's say you were free falling from the sky into the state of Iowa. You'd have a parachute, okay? Where would be the best place to land? The answer, Jefferson County. The reason, JFAN. Can we be honest? How many of you here tonight are totally freaked out about King Moose? Good. No, I mean bad. I'm here to tell you that there's no need to freak out because there's no better place in Iowa to be than Jefferson County. JFAN has your back. And yes, it's true, as Diane mentioned, that Jefferson County gets CAFOs every year, more CAFOs every year. We've had some high profile ones this summer. But the truth is that we're doing far better than our neighbors in Washington and Keokuk counties, which have 10 times the number of hogs than we do. And with the help of JFAN, we're successfully discouraging the wholesale creep of infringing CAFOs. And tonight, tonight's annual meeting is dedicated to positive trends. We're going to hear stories and, and real experiences of alternatives that work and that can lead us in a, in a different direction and a much better future. And I think that you're going to come away feeling much more hopeful. But we're not there yet. And we must never become complacent. With JFAN's help, the battle to prioritize people's rights over corporate rights and to fight infringing CAFOs and protect our quality of life is a cause that grows stronger every year, every day. And now I'm going to put on my glasses and really see what I'm reading. <laughs> this is known as denial. <laughs> on a personal note, I've got to share this. On a personal note, this year I had my own CAFO encounter. Unbeknownst to my wife and me and 115 households in the area, Mike Keller was setting up a 1,249 head CAFO only a mile and a half south of our, our place, south of town. And this is the closest CAFO to, to the town of Fairfield yet. And Mr. K Keller was flying under the radar and he was not informing any of his neighbors about what he was going to do. And by the way, we should mention that informing your neighbors before you build a CAFO isn't only a, a, a common courtesy, it's a policy that's actually documented and recommended in the Iowa Pork Producers Association's best management practices. Even the industry knows that you've got to tell your neighbors. But we didn't have a clue that he was planning to break ground and had already cut a long-term deal with tri -Oak Foods, a large CAFO corporation located near Muscatine. And this is a smaller size CAFO so that the DNR doesn't even track it. And we wouldn't have known until the, the smell hit us literally in the face. But JFAN picked up the trail early and alerted us about the threat before Mr. K Keller actually broke ground. And we immediately pulled in JFAN's help and expertise and then initiated action steps, including several meetings with Keller and tri -Oak. And JFAN has been with us at every step, every step of the way, providing valuable informational support and guidance. So we're never dealing with the situation alone. And we're dealing with the situation in a smart way. Just like JFAN did for the community group near Huber Gapo that asked for their help. JFAN came through for them as well. Now, oh, it's already up. Look at the chart behind me. You see that Keokuk and Washington counties combined have 1.3 million hogs. These are old statistics, by the way. These are old numbers. The numbers are higher than this. The current number for Jefferson County is 165,000 hogs, so we have less than one-tenth of the hogs in our neighbor's area. And you look on the right, two million hogs for all six surrounding counties. 
We're doing pretty good. And make no mistake, make no mistake, this is because we have JFAN in our corner. Nobody else does. But besides these numbers, you want to know how I know that JFAN is making a difference? You may not believe this, but Tri-Oak refused to take a meeting with us if JFAN's executive director, Diane Rosenberg, was going to be there. <laughs> because they know that JFAN can cut through their talking points and expose the myths. And this proves that this organization is doing its job, effectively speaking truth to power. Can everyone say, JFAN right on? JFAN right on! Let's put it down the middle. JFAN and right on. JFAN right on! My wife is thoroughly embarrassed. <laughs> All right. Here's another sign of JFAN's influence. The day before the Keller meeting, this was kind of amazing to me. The day before the Keller meeting, I received an anonymous phone call from one of Keller's neighbors. He's a local, local farmer. I never learned what his name was. But he, too, was opposed to the CAFO that was coming in but he didn't dare go public for fear of being ostracized. He did say, though, that he understood and he was not surprised that tri -Oak didn't want Diane to be present because JFAN really knows its stuff. <laughs> really good news. So ladies and gentlemen, let us be clear. JFAN isn't a luxury, it's a necessity our community's lifeline to the future. We can't afford to be passive unless we don't mind the state of Iowa becoming an environmental disaster just like North Carolina. The truth is, beating the capo behemoth is not going to be fast, it's not going to be easy. Stemming the growth of capos is trench warfare. It's a marathon, not a sprint. We're in it for the long haul. But then again, no important social change has ever taken place overnight. And thankfully, JFO is leading the way in Jefferson County. It's a good time to applaud. Here's the bottom line, the real bottom line. Financial support for JFAN needs to become a regular part of your family and business annual budget. Scrimping on JFAN is in truth scrimping on ourselves, on our own lifeline, right now, and on our, our investment in the future. And the time to act is now, tonight. My friends, I close with an urgent message, an urgent request. Please give generously to support JFAN's work this year. Our community has never been this informed or this engaged, and we owe it to Diane Rosenberg and her dedicated team JFAN's board of directors, our legal counsel, David Sykes, and numerous volunteers to support the important work they're, they're doing on behalf of us all. Now please, take out your checkbooks. Come on. <laughs> please take out your checkbooks and write a generous check and hand it to one of the volunteers standing patiently in the aisles. JFAN is spelled J F A N, and remember your donations are tax deductible because we're a 501c3. We'll be taking the next five minutes to collect checks. It's time to prioritize people over industry, to protect people's rights over corporate rights. With JFAN's help, we will, we must make it happen. Speak with your checkbook as though your life depends on it, because it does. Thank you.
Tokyo. And thanks to him. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our, our co-sponsors that partner the JFAN uh, with JFAN for our annual meeting. As you see on the screen here, they are the Southeast Iowa Sierra Club, the Sustainable Living Coalition, and Little Village Magazine. Let's give them a yeah. We appreciate the sponsorship and the cooperation. We also want to thank now our corporate sponsors. So we can show the corporate sponsors on the screen, and I won't read through these, but I'll give a, a few seconds to uh, go through the slides, if you will. Go ahead and move on through. Okay. Silver sponsors. And... Bronze sponsors. <coughs> and I'm not quite sure where we end here, but so if you kind of cover it up and we're through, that is it. So thank you to our, our corporate sponsors. <laughs> Next, as you, as you know, Tuesday, November the 6th will be election day. So we would like to ask everyone who is running for public office to stand up and be recognized. I don't know if we can get the house lights up so you can see who all is here or not, but if you stand up, yes. Everyone who's running for office, we appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you very much for coming out. Now I'd like to have all of the public officials stand, regardless of whether you're running for office or even an elected position. We really appreciate your public service, so if you would stand, whether you're running for office or not, if you're here from the county or the city or anywhere, we appreciate you standing at this point. Well, I don't know. No. <laughs> We have here, but anyway, we appreciate, we do appreciate the public service that people put in, you know, to, for the uh, administration and the government of our county. Thank you very much. And now it's time for our keynote presentation for the evening. I'd like to introduce to you, if you will come on and start up here, Ray Hay Hazlitt Marquan. And if you'll please excuse any mispronunciation, I did, did the best that I could here. Ray Hay is, Ray Hay is uh, Chief Strategy Officer for Main Street Project in Northfield, Iowa, I mean Northfield, Minnesota. He's the principal architect of this innovative poultry center regenerative farming system. And he'll tell us much more about this this evening in his presentation and on the panel. He also oversees the implementation of restorative blueprints for various communities across the United States in Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. So let's give a big Fairfield welcome to Ray. for this warm and awesome Fairfield welcome. Um, is the projection gonna start? Do I forward it? Or do you forward it? There we go, finally. And it's not gonna forward from here, is it? Oh yeah, it is. Okay, so first of all, thank you again for this 
warm welcome. I, I have been here before and uh, I really like this town. If I had to move anywhere, this is the place I'll move to. Uh, uh, I'm going to tell you more than give you this, you know, traditional keynote where people go through a lot of data and stuff like that. I'm going to just go back to my traditional storytelling. Okay, I'm, I come from a storytelling tradition where we have built over centuries, you know, this wealth of knowledge and wisdom, which has nothing to do with getting PhDs or master's degrees at universities, but it's one of the most useful things we have ever done in the face of what we are encountering today in a degenerating world. That wisdom is really what is lacking today in all of the knowledge that we have floating around. In fact, if you take a look, most of the systems that are being deployed around that you are now having to fight, they were not designed and deployed and engineered by the folks uh, who come from uh, humble beginnings or from humble communities or that are just trying to make a living. Most of them, if you look back, most of them got PhDs and masters behind their names. <laughs> and that is a testament to the whole world we live on today where knowledge has now been corrupted just the same way as many other systems in our society and turn away from wisdom. If there was wisdom applied to all these processes, you would have no cave was here with, without Jay Fan having to be fighting them. If there was wisdom behind the way we plan. Because food is... Thank you. So my story comes from actually, not from producing and, and not from consuming and not from buying food. My story comes from producing, buying, and consuming nutrition. Very different thing. What we, what we buy today at the store is primarily what I call fill. It's not food. Because food is supposed to nourish your soil, your soul, your body, and your spirit. And the spirit is among the three the most important. And when your food comes from a degenerating system that destroys the societies where it's grown, the communities, the ecology, and the social fabric that th those communities depend on, that food is going to impoverish your spirit as well. So, that's my story. That's where we're going to start. This is where this way forward came for us. I am the product of chickens, literally. And here's why. I grew up in extreme poverty, in, you know, hungry every day for at least up to the time that I was seven years old. But the one thing we always had, and it's the only reason I was able to develop neurologically enough to be able to not become a statistic in Guatemala was because we had eggs and we had meat from chickens. And that was one thing that nobody could take away from us and we didn't have to purchase, so we didn't have, need to have money for it. And so from that, we did many other things. And uh, here we are today telling you the story of how the chicken can actually change the world and how regenerative agriculture in general, especially when it has to do with animals, is actually the way forward. So I'm gonna show you some of these facts and numbers and uh, you know, still make it more like a traditional uh, keynote as you probably are used to. And if this thing went forward for me, first of all, well, it's got a little bit of delay time there. This is our team in Minnesota. Overall, we have 75 people directly connected to our system, over 150 indirectly connected to our system, and we have now operations in uh, Guatemala, in four regions, in Mexico and San Miguel de Allende, distributing products all the way through uh, Mexico City with over 350 farms associated in that operation. And we, our main operations out of Minnesota, where we are now deploying a southeastern Minnesota um, cluster of farms that is um, intended to produce significant um, uh, products, but also significant regeneration to that region. And it's part of my mission to be here tonight to actually engage in deploying a cluster in this region. And you will see what that means in a minute. But it, it does start one chicken at a time. Now, the, um, the, the, the most important thing, and I start with this always, is that you know, we need to have a clear destination. What is it that we want to do? In, in Guatemala, by the way, we have a saying that says, if you don't know where you're going, every bus takes you there. <laughs> so we got to know where we're going. And for us, this is where we're going. 
to produce healthy, nutritious food, to restore and enhance the ecological systems, to sequester carbon, because we got too much of it in the air, as you well know, clean the waterways, eliminate toxic inputs, deliver ag-based resilient economic development opportunities for communities, and especially alternative systems so farmers can launch on to a new way of using their land and their resources and their God-given right to be on earth. And especially the dignity of being a farmer which has nothing to do with CAFOs. So basically the triple bottom line, that, you know, you, you saw a flash, that's the triple bottom line. Uh, this is um, what we start, we start with people. Here's an important fact, the pigs and the CAFOs, they are not the ones polluting the soil, polluting the water, polluting everything. It's people who put them there. It's people who design that system. It's people who buy those products. Without customers, those cables would be nothing. Couldn't exist. It's people. We are the problem. Not the chickens, not the pigs, not the cows, not the trees. So that is important for us to remember. And there is no better place to start than the most important subsidy that global food production, corporate systems receive, which is cheap labor, which they can just shut down, and when they protest, put them back into whatever position they want to. Discrimination and abuse of labor force in the food system is one of the most incredibly aggressive and degenerating in almost any industry. And it's one of the reasons you can call the end product cheap, besides other subsidies. But this is the biggest one. So we studied with people, and who are they? Well, mostly immigrant farmers. And so, so we design for the immigrant farm first, but also we design for the farm workers. We also design for the established farmer who wants to join our system, for the folks from the processing, aggregation, and distribution, and so on, up the supply chain. And to do this, you need to design not a farm, but an actual system. And by that we mean the whole supply chain, all the way from the farm to you as a user, if you are not a farmer yourself. Okay, let's see if this is going to help here. There's some issues on that forwarding. So, bottom line is this. When we think about farmers, when we make the mistakes that the industrial system is making is when we think that we are producers of things. And we tend to look at that into a linear way. So we put some stuff in the ground or in the cave or whatever it is, and then we put certain inputs, we do certain things, and at the other end comes a pig and a lot of manure and all those other things, right? That's a very linear way of thinking, which is absolutely contrary to the way nature produces nutrition. So nutrition comes as a different result, and the way it does is, it really, for millions of years, nature has designed this magnificent system of taking unedible energy in the form of manure and soil and plants and all of that, and turns it into edible energy in the form of carrots and lettuce and, carrot and, and, and chickens and eggs and pigs. But we farmers, we don't produce anything. It's nature that does that. And the more we interfere with nature, the less efficient it is and the more polluting it is. And the more we work with nature with those energy cycles, the better the product, the more efficient it is, and the more wholesome everything is. We don't have to pollute the water and all of that, but we have to think not as producers, but as managers of energy from unedible to edible. And this is how it goes. You start with energy, enters into our poultry system. We're going to be talking about poultry, but this same blueprint is, is exactly the same we're using for pork, for turkey, and other animals. Just so you know that we're just using this as a way to show you how we think about this, you know, geophysical processes that they take that energy that went into the poultry as feed, and some of it, you know, gets pooped out outside because these are tree range chickens, you know, out in the, in the fields, under trees, and all of that. Um, from that, we get certain outputs, you know, inside the paddocks where the, the, the chickens are raised. And by this, uh, I, will, I will explain to you in a second. This, uh, from this first round of energy cycling, we harvest uh, blank space. And <laughs> <laughs> we harvest um, primarily, you know, the meat, the eggs, and from the canopies above the poultry, we harvest hazelnuts and trees, fruits, and all kinds of other products. Now, that energy was transformed partially into those edible products, but some of it became byproducts in the form of biomass and all of that. And some of it actually became part of a 
um, you know, energy in the form of manure, giblets, feathers, and all of that. So we take that extra energy, we move it outside of where the chickens are roaming, and then we call this non-paddock production or landscape-based production, which is more like a regular farm with, with, with corn and soybeans, or well, not soybeans, but we don't like those, the, the soybeans, <laughs> but um, other kinds of small grains. And out of that system, you know, that space outside of the poultry production, uh, we harvest again another layer of energy. And this is still energy that went into the system in the form of feed that just keep transforming and transforming and transforming. We haven't put any new energy into yet. And now we produce vegetables, grains, and all kinds of other crops, which some of, it, some of them can go back to the, um, to the system in the form of poultry grain again. And so this cycle, the reason it regenerates, is because fundamentally nature takes about, from all of the stuff you see out there, approximately 80% of it is actually not from the soil, it's from the air, it's free. It doesn't have to be purchased by any farmer. And so from all of that energy that is free that we capture, only about 80, I mean 20 to 30% gets harvested in the form of grains and meat. The next 70% of it goes back into the system and becomes part of this magnificent energy cycle which is endless. It's exactly the way it was always. It's the way nature intended. It produces massive amounts of food and it can do it for as long as we want to be around this earth. So I don't want to go too far over time, and I only have three minutes or so. But I did get authorization to go like one minute. So, uh, um, so here's to make it simpler for you to understand. This is what a production unit looks like. We got buildings just like regular production, but we put the chickens outdoors. And so there's two paddocks. They are planted with perennial crops. We call them canopy. Canopies. In those canopies, we plant hazelnuts, elderberries, native species from any ecology we go. So in Mexico, we use certain certain, canop certain species. Here, we use other species. It doesn't matter. The key is that this system can be applied at one and a half acres for meat chickens and three acres for egg layers. We can apply to almost any of the 500 million small farmers who own under 10 hectares that produce 70% of the food that we eat today in the world, according to the UN. The key is, it's compatible to every farmer, but also, if you've got a larger farm, it's, it also works for you, but it doesn't discriminate against the small farmer. And that is a fundamental thing, because we normally design for this side of the population, and it discriminates against the rest of it. When we design for the other side, it just happens that it never discriminates against the other side. And that's the way we approach this. So anyway, this is just to give you a picture of what a production unit looks like. But fundamentally, that production unit gets aggregated in a farm, two, three, four, five production units, and then you take many farmers in a region like Jefferson County, and you put them together into what we call a cluster, and out of that cluster, you get the foundation for a multiple level enterprise system integration. So you get the poultry, both meat and eggs, you aggregate first processing, you bring back grain processing, you aggregate the producers of grain, you put together all of these different components. Now you've got manure management instead of manure pits. All of this is, is, is managed because it's energy, it's, it's money we already spent. So we don't want it to go into the soil or into the water. We want it to be put into another production system that is part of the, of the same flow. And so the energy equation also turns into an enterprise design and rural development strategy with a capacity to integrate from 14 to 20 different enterprise sectors that together can turn a dollar into up to $12 instead of what we get today where we put a dollar into a, a farm and as a whole, as a community, we get 75 cents, which means we get 25 cents less than we put in. And that's why we have to subsidize the systems with taxpayers' money, with our own consumer money, and with cheap labor. That's why we have such, an, such, such a degenerating uh, situation is because we never aggregated it for economic and wealth creation, but rather we aggregated it for the pure purpose of extracting nature's wealth and turning it into into the hands of a few. So that's my um, time to uh, stop. Pause.
So these generate the need for system level services, enterprise management, financial land access, governance, R&D, training, extension, PR, you name it. Everything exactly the way we design economies with the difference that it regenerates instead of degenerating. Now at the other end, what we have is the other blank screen, and also, you know, this regenerative wealth creation and well-being, triple bottom line impact. But what I mean by this is that this is wealth that keeps building on because the wealth itself is the foundation of the energy cycle. And if the energy regenerates, so does the wealth. See, we lost track of that when we designed the current system. Uh, well, I mean, the corporations didn't lose track of that. We, communities, we did. And we gave away the ownership and control, something so fundamental that we should have never done. Mm -hmm. Hazelnuts, uh, these are now part of our system. So now we can deploy pork production because pork fed with hazelnuts is one of the best freaking pork you could ever eat. <laughs> and it grows outside under the forest as well. Pork and turkey and chickens are jungle animals. They are not supposed to be in buildings. This is a garlic, alicrop garlic, completely 100% fertilized with the manure from the poultry units. There is no chickens here now. This is, we're talking about landscape management, alley cropping of other crops that we can put them back into the system like I described. You know, but the chicken, again, is a tree range. Get it? <laughs> so tree range is what you're going to want to be looking for in the market if you really want to start shifting that wealth trans transfer from consumers over to corporate systems that don't care about our communities to corporate systems that are owned and controlled by us, you know, from the bottom up. So, I'll take just 30 more seconds, 45 seconds. Um, this is the process by which we deploy a, a region. We prove the concept, we build the farms, we do go regional, and we institutionalize. Meaning, we put it into curriculum all the way through from elementary schools as far as you want to take it as a community. But those are the four steps by which we can take this system and deploy it into a region. So, bottom line is, you know, this is, this is um, a, one of the early un developing units, hazelnuts, we planted corn and all of that, here's the coop. Uh, we used to have lunches right up here. One of our senators got married right in front of the coop because he wanted that. Uh, so no smell, no, none of that fall stuff, and a lot of really beautiful space to enjoy your, your backyard. Um, this is a 0.6 production unit. In 2011, I grossed $45,000 worth of this unit. 0.6 acres. This is the, our 100 acre uh, Main Street uh, demonstration and training farm. This is going to have you know, seven production units. Some of you have come and visited this place and I invite more people to come and do. Here is the blueprint of a actual production unit with doors for the chickens to go outside. This is the solarium where they spend part of the time in the cold area, in the cold season. And these are the doors that they go in and out to the main insulated area. The key is to keep them outdoors. Um, and so, you know, with uh, um, this, I'm going to skip all of the details, but as I go, take a look at how we have calculated all of the P&Ls and all of that already, so that as farmers come into this, we know that an estimated income per production unit, you know, for meat birds is approximately $41,000, with $33,000 of that going straight to the farmer who grew the chickens, and the rest of it going in different places, including it's up to $7,500 worth of hazelnuts that the chickens weeded and fertilized themselves. Um, this gives us an average of around $27 per acre, which is, uh, you know, in farm language, if you are a farmer, you will know that's enviable. Um, you know, in the case of eggs, upwards of 3,000 uh, eggs, egg layers per unit puts us at around, you know, $66,000 per acre of income on one of these units. So we're not talking about little farms here and there, you know. Now, if you go there and think, okay, well, let's develop a cluster and let's put 250 of these units, we can produce upwards, okay, please don't fail me right now. Um, um, you know, you know up, deploy up to 5,000 acres in this process, over uh, around 375 in actual poultry producing and the rest of you know, those other crops that I mentioned before, we can produce easily as a launching pad up to 1.1 million broilers under this system, you know, with a, a, in pounds of 4.5 million out of this, you know, with this daily processing, 
with a mobile processing unit we're deploying in Minnesota, we can process up to this much, which means we can have two of those or build a bigger unit, creating real jobs, well-paying jobs and all of that, provide uh, supply uh, demand for the farmers who grow the grain, and build, you know, take back around $20 million worth of broiler market with this very, very small 5,000 acre blueprint. You know, a lot of farmers around here actually own 5,000 acres themselves. Um, so, um, we have built a lot of partnerships nationally, regionally, that are supporting, are behind us to make sure that we can do this. And bottom line, what I wanted to say today, the message of all of this, I know is I can't give, you know, do fairness to the amount of, of information and storytelling I wanted to do, but the bottom line is we do not need CAFOs. In fact, animals were not designed to be in the farm. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. asking uh, questions later on, so you can hear more from him later. Uh, the next on our program is a panel discussion, and I'm not sure how the table gets out here, but I assume that that will happen. Uh, panel discussion, and it will continue on the theme of tonight's program by exploring alternatives to factory farms or kefos. So I'm going to introduce the panel, but please hold your applause till we come through. So I would like to start uh, Ray, if you would come back up and take a seat as soon as we get the seats out here. Ray, he's going to be on the panel here tonight. And uh, the next on the panel, if you all would come on up as I call your name, is uh, Chris Johnson. Chris is manager of the new Regenerative Agricultural Project at Maharishi University of Management. Chris has previously managed... Chris has previously managed Fairfield's Farm to School Greenhouse and was assistant director of the Red Earth Gardens, which is the Meskwaki uh, National or Nation's Vegetable Farm in Kama Island. Okay, next on our panel, and we, we'll get you applause when we get all through here. Okay. Next on our panel is Dean Goodall. Dean, if you'd come up. Dean is the founder of Legacy Pork, which is a new and promising alternative to CAFOs for farmers in Jefferson County. And he'll tell you a lot more about this when, uh, in the, the panel presentation. Dean previously launched and managed Maharishi Vedic Organic Farm for 10 years before he started in this endeavor. Okay, our final panel member then is Chris Peterson. Chris is a longtime acquaintance of mine, and he's the producer of the Berkshire pork that my wife Ellen and I have been enjoying from our freezer for a while. We bought a half pig from Chris, and Chris is a traditional independent family farmer who raises non kfo pork for discriminating customers. He's also a consultant for the Social Responsible Agriculture Project and a board member of Organization for Competitive Markets, and he's a well-known national advocate for independent family farms. And finally, our moderator of tonight's panel is Francis Tickey. Uh, Francis needs no introduction to most of us here in Fairfield because he produces the milk and yogurt that many of us drink uh, every day of the week. He's a co-owner with his wife Susan of Radiance Dairy, which is located just north of town. He's also a former member of the National Organic Standard Board and a previous candidate for Iowa Secretary of Agriculture, a member of the Fairfield Municipal Band, uh, in addition, he's a JFAN board member, and you could probably go on down to a longer list. So let's welcome the panel with a round of applause, okay? So, Francis, at this point, the panel is all yours, okay? Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you, John. It's my privilege to be able to moderate this panel with all this collective wisdom here. What we're going to do is have these uh, first three panelists each speak for about five minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Well, first I'm, I have a few questions for them, and then the four of them will respond to questions. So first of all, um, I think, was it Chris Johnson on the first? Are you first, John, Chris? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Hello. 
Hello. We have three main goals at the MUM Regenerative Organic Agriculture Farm. We produce the best food possible. I mean safe, healthy, and nutrient-dense food. We use the best practices that are practically possible. We use tried and true organic methods, such as compost and crop rotation, but we also use a mix of experimental, new, and sometimes student-led initiatives. But the most important thing we do on the farm is educate our students on how we do both of those things. We commit to making our farm and our models as real to life as possible. We believe that our students should be prepared for the real world. But what is the reality of the real world? Markets that don't pay conventional farmers a fair wage, often leaving them to farm for a break even at best. Temperamental and changing environmental conditions when we get summer in March and a quarter of our annual rainfall in a two-week period in August. <laughs> and shrinking small communities and booming urban sprawl, which devastates our local economies and food systems. Given such conditions, how do we hope to educate our students effectively? How can we ethically teach them anything? Well, I believe we need to return to the basics. We need to go back to the very core principles that allow agriculture to flourish anywhere in the world. And where do we find those principles? Conventional models? No, we've been talking about that all this evening. They're not really working that well. Ag textbooks? Well, it's kind of more of the same. No, we look to nature. Nature's been doing guess and check for about a million years. Probably more. Nature fertilizes itself and manages its own pests. Nature produces multiple yields in the same footprint that no, other, no one organism could possibly hope to consume on its own. And nature functions in holes as interconnected systems where if one link breaks, two more fill in. Instead of teaching methods that challenge and fight nature every step of the way, we want to teach models and thinking that lead to working with nature that mimic it and focus its yields in ways that, we are, that are useful to us. No slides, it's okay. Um, do we have it? Yeah. Another one? Don't pay attention to that one. Uh, these are the principles and ethics that I found exemplified in the tree range poultry system. Tree range poultry thinks of chickens like this. Multiple outputs. Products and behaviors that can be seen as yields and services. Inputs that come from diverse sources, grains, forage, food scraps. It functions using ecological principles allowing diverse scales from the backyard size to a full-on modern CAFO size. It can function in multiple environments from South, Central, and North America and any farmer can run it at any experience level, from beginner to expert. I was excited to learn about and implement the Main Street Project model myself, and I went there. I had to know. I had to see it for myself, how it works and how we can do it here. MUM, Fairfield Economic Development Leaders, and Jefferson County residents are all engaged in starting a tree-range poultry system here. We have the beginnings of one system at our MUM training farm, and we're also identifying other sites around the county where they could possibly be implemented. We planted about two acres of hazelnuts at the training farm, have a tentative building site for the facility for the chickens themselves, and more space on site for more chickens if, if necessary. We're working with the community to try to figure out where this will work best, either at MUM or somewhere else. This is about more than trying out a new agricultural production model. This is about our community and keeping it vibrant and a joy to live in for the generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We look forward to seeing this project develop. And Dean Goodell, if Dean wants to send over there, go ahead. Yes. Dean has launched a new, exciting new, new business, New Legacy Pork. I'm very interested to learn more about this. All right. First of all, I want to congratulate JFAN for hosting this forum on alternative animal production protocols. <laughs> Having made my living farming for the past 20 years, I understand agricultural practices. 
challenges facing the industry, and supply and demand issues. And I've also come to the same conclusion that JFAN has regarding our best options for addressing the animal confinement threat. And the models put forth here tonight are the solution. The fact is that over 7 billion of the 7.5 billion people on this planet eat meat, and pork leads all meat categories in terms of consumption. Sorry, Richie. Chicken's number two. <laughs> there is global demand for meat products. It's not going away anytime soon, and we live in an area where production of that meat will take place. But we do have an opportunity to impact the manner in which livestock is raised. We do have an opportunity to improve air and water quality. And we also have an opportunity to heal the social divide that pits farming interests against community interests. We have an opportunity to create a win-win for all concerned. That was all supposed to be on the first slide. Okay. Uh, so we have an opportunity to create a win-win for all concerned, and that's why I started New Legacy Pork. Um, if you look at the logo, New Legacy is our company, and Big Belly is our brand. Again, I didn't do that. There's our brand. Okay. So what is New Legacy Pork? All right. New Legacy, we, we manage production, processing, and marketing. On the production end, we currently have 14 farmers contracted to produce with it for us. Our current production is at over 13,000 hog a year pace with sales value of over $10 million annually. That is in place now and will increase quickly as we add more farmers to our program. As far as processing goes, we've, co we've contracted with a USDA certified processing facility in Des Moines, but our main focus is our marketing. We're primarily focused as, as set up as a marketing company. Um, it's really the missing link in, in a lot of the efforts that individual farmers have to try to market, to, to, to produce alternative products. We have, an, we have a two-pronged marketing approach. We have an in-house direct marketing program that's being spearheaded by Cliff Rose. We will advertise on a variety of platforms and consumers will be able to purchase our product directly from our webpage. We will also be selling through retail outlets. For this, we have partnered with Damon Worldwide. Damon's the largest food distributor in the United States. They have a major division dedicated to fresh meat sales. And what's amazing is we've signed a contract with them guaranteeing the sales of all of our product. In addition to accessing Damon's expertise in creative design, labeling, packaging, sales, and distribution, our contract with Damon puts us in a position a startup like ours could only dream of. It also gives us nearly unlimited growth potential. So quickly, what we're, what we're doing with our program, um, the, the two primary things we, that make us different, we're following an animal husbandry and animal welfare program called Global Animal Partnership. It's a third-party verification system for animal welfare. Also non-GMO project verified. And for us, non-GMO project verified is not just the contents of our, our processed um, food products, but all of the feed that's fed to our animals is also non-GM certified. The Global Animal Partnership is a five-step five process. We're at level three. Uh, level three is where the outdoor access and 24-hour outdoor access is first mandated for the animals. So that's part of our program. Um, in addition to those two things, I mean, and a lot of these are, are fall under the Global Animal Partnership. We're antibiotic free, we're hormone free. Outdoor access I mentioned. Sustainable farming practices are, are implemented. No liquid manure pits whatsoever. All of our manure is aerobically composted. You pretty much have to stand on top of these things to smell them. I invite you to do that if you like. Um, at ractopamine free, we have deep bedded straw for our animals. Comfort, uh, humanely raised. Community friendly, what I mean by that basically is um, 
The smell doesn't leave the farm. This does not impact neighbors in the way that a confinement does. We don't, and then again, it's more of the um, humanely raised, uh, no fairing trades. We also don't do teeth clipping, tail docking, nose ringing, etc. Okay, also this is important. What, what, are, we, what are we offering farmers? Um, lower entry costs and lower financial risk. The, 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 the business of going into a business for a CAFO confinement is, um, it, it's actually quite a bit of debt you go into as a farmer. Um, with our program, you, you really don't need to do into a fraction of the amount of debt. Um, and we offer educational opportunities, animal ownership, chance to farm full time. That's a big thing for farmers, by the way, being able to farm full time. Um, with the CAFO model, they, they, they tell you, well, in 10 to 12 years when you pay off your mortgage, then, then it's all going to be, you know, peaches and cream. Um, chance of farm full time with our program, you can probably get to that point within the first year of, of working with us. We also offer financing assistance through uh, regional banks. We pay top dollar for the animals. And we also have 15% profit sharing that we do with our producers. The way forward here is to offer farmers an option that is ethically and environmentally more in line with an agricultural model this community and JFAN accepts and create incentives, including healthy financial incentives for farmers to pursue this, uh, this alternative. I started New Lessee Pork to address the confinement issue in a positive and proactive manner. If you agree with this approach and would be interested in supporting this project through investment, please let me know. Working together, we can ensure Fairfield remains a shining example of community, ecology, education, enlightenment, entrepreneurship, and all possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. It's really great to have this opportunity available here locally for farmers who want to do something besides cables. Next, uh, my good friend Chris Peterson is going to be speaking. And every time I go up to the Des Moines, up to the Capitol, or somewhere where something is happening, Chris is there. And probably he's there a lot of times when I'm not there. Actually, Chris was given the name uh, by RFK Jr. Um, Robert, 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 uh, RFK, Robert, Robert Kennedy Jr., yeah. Um, the name Freedom Fighter, right, Chris? Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a long, long day. I come from about four hours north of here. Um, I get around a lot. I bleed rural. I bleed and stand with and feel the pain and the good things about family farm agriculture. I've been doing this for 25 years alongside of farming myself. And this is me. Uh, this is my sow herd, part of it. Um, these gals are all gonna have babies. Looks like they're a couple months away, but um, That's, that's some of my little ones, they're a few days old, and I use a European model, it's too hard to explain it, but I throw this out separately, either in A-houses or in individual little buildings that have stalls in them where the sows can go in and out. I call them sow condos. <laughs> And the little pigs, when they get big, big enough, they can get out, but at about 10 days old, the wife and I start gathering them up and castrating the males and vaccinating. I don't do antibiotics for anything. I don't need to. Um, and then we group the sows together along with the little pigs, probably 10, 12, 15 litters per bunch with an area the little pigs can go back in. and have a couple of heat lamps, draws them away from mama on cooler nights so they don't get laid on. There's also starter feed back in there so they get start eating. And at about four to five weeks, I don't wean early. I c 
common sense farming, okay? It's far cheaper to feed one mouse than eight or nine mouse. And so I don't wean the little pigs till they're four to five weeks old. I take the sows out, leave the pigs in the building with the same environment, the heat lamps and everything for a while. Heck of a lot less stress. So that's one of the reasons you don't need the antibiotics and all this other stuff. It's called raising hogs on the cheap. And I've always done it this way. And it's better for the animals, it's better for the farmer, it's better for the farmer's pocketbook because they're putting more money in it than leaving. And by that I mean, you know, the cable industry put up these expensive buildings. I, I associate these young farmers getting started um, putting up cables and everything comparable to the urban people, the urban kids who have this massive college debt they're forever stuck with. And when you raise livestock this way, you're going to make some money. And, you know, it's all about local and sustainable. And organics is fine, but I'm sold on local and sustainable. Know your farmer, know your food. And, oop, always playing the wrong way. Uh, wow, okay. we're going into hyperspace here. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, part of a letter I had to bring in last fall because they got cold. And again, this is a family farm, not a corporate farm. Uh, brought them in the house, put a heat lamp over them, and they were barely moving when I brought them in. Within an hour and a half, they were hungry. They were looking for mama. So back outside we go. Well, this is what happens when you farrow in the spring especially and it starts getting warmer days, warmer and warmer, and the natural heat lamp. These little pigs come out and lay like this, it's sunbathing. <laughs> they love the warm sun and the clean air and everything else, just like humans do, right? That's one of the end results. Uh, <laughs> Berkshire bacon, best on the planet as far as I'm concerned. The Berkshire breed, uh, nationwide, um, domestic, they've won tasting awards and meat quality awards across the board, even by the national pork producers, believe it or not. They have to admit to a few things. <laughs> Another end result, uh, pork chops on the grill. Uh, best on the planet as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that, this is uh, our two grandkids and um, our daughter and that's her husband there, Curtis. They got an acreage and they're doing a lot of things with some cattle and uh, sustainable food, marketing, everything else. So she's they're starting to get into this a little bit too, very proud of them. And of course, my pigs. I guess that's it. But to top it off, um, again, there's ways for family farmers to stay in business and do things within the social parameters. You don't stink up the neighborhood. You don't ruin people's water. Uh, animal welfare, everything included in that. And quite frankly, as a farmer, I'm not an animal rights guy, but I sure the heck am an animal welfare guy. I believe in taking care of these animals. Uh, I belong to a group, marketing group called Berkshire Good Gold. Um, we have a few hundred producers across the state of Iowa and um, we had group marketing contracts, um, not individual contracts, um, and it seems to work very well. The prices are good, keeps me in business. I sell a lot of uh, 
pigs on Facebook now. Uh, face, Facebook marketing, unbelievable. <laughs> the growth in that. And it's an easy sell. I just post pictures of my pigs and explain the process for what I do. And I got pigs going to Missouri, Minnesota, Wisconsin, all over. And nobody complains. No, but I have never had complaints on this one. And animal husbandry doesn't exist anymore in, in the pig world. Not one land grant in this country teaches animal husbandry anymore. It's animal science. That's what has happened to this industry. And quite frankly, what I'm doing today, I was doing basically with a few changes, same thing 25, 30 years ago. Back then, it was called mainstream agriculture. You know what they call it now? Niche or alternative. That's what the industry and the politicians and federal farm policy have done to the family farm. Pretty sad. So, all I can say is support your local farmer regardless of what he's producing. And by the way, the industry talks about all of us pork producers. I don't raise pork. I'm not a pork producer, I'm a pig farmer. I raise pigs. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well, now, the process now is that we're going to just discuss for a few minutes here, and then there'll be a five minute break and then we'll take questions um, from the audience. And John, you'll have to be the timekeeper here. Okay, so I had a, a question for the panel, first of all. What has to happen for these alternative, regen I mean, you don't call them alternative, regenerative farming systems to be financially viable for a larger cross-section of farmers? Um, well, like I was mentioning up there, you guys, we all got to, as family farmers, we got to start working for ourselves again. Figure out a way to keep the bankers and the input specialists <laughs> and all them people out of your pocket. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these guys, they end up working for the CAFO owner, or I mean, yeah, the CAFO owners like Smithfield or whoever you'll end up working for the machinery companies, uh, the fertilizer companies, the chemical country companies, and at the end of the day, at the end of the year, you're hoping for a sliver to be able to live off of. And that, that's the problem I see in agriculture today. A number of years ago, I think it was 10, 12 years ago, um, Des Moines Register, uh, the ag guy over there, he's retired now, Jerry Perkins, Wonderful guy. Called me up one day and he says, hey, you interested in doing a story? I said, well, yeah, what are we gonna talk about? And he ran a story on me how this farmer was making more money raising 400 pigs a year than he was when he was a commercial grower in the 90s for the a Hogs hit, uh, raising 3,000 head of pigs a year. That's, that's the key, smarts. Know your business, know what to do. You know, I call it farming smart instead of letting everybody get in your pocket. So for us, it was, it was really a matter of answering that question way before we got any farmers uh, producing poultry for, uh, for the tree range label. The first thing we knew was that as a farmer, uh, we are nobodies really in this conventional system. Um, even as a regional farmers, it's still way, way too small to actually have any economic power, any influence at the level that we need to have it to make it more affordable for a lot more farmers. 
So the, the first thing we did was we, we looked at different layers of the system infrastructure we had to build. You know, growing pork, I mean, or, or pigs, or a, uh, growing chickens <clears throat> and, and farming, that is not a system. That's a operation that we run on our, on our own farm. This is part of a larger system. And what makes it affordable and possible and economically feasible for those individual farmers to actually become fee, um, um, you know, uh, for a system to make it more affordable, more spread out for those farmers to be able to access the system is to put pieces of infrastructure that actually align with them. So the first thing we did was, just like uh, we were learning about the new legacy pork, was a financial infrastructure. That's the first step. And how our farmers are going to get, they're going to either buy land or build the barns or buy the checks and buy the feed and all of that. Even if they're buying it from the neighbor, there's still exchange of money and all of that and it has to be in place. So we partnered with uh, Share Capital, it's a national capital financing company. And then we went around the country and started to gather financial investors and all of that to line up behind Share Capital so that all of the farmers that come into, want to come into Tree Range have access to that initial capital, both for infrastructure and also for uh, real estate. The real estate side, we worked it out with Iroquois Valley Farms out of Illinois. So with them on one side and with the share capital on the other, we secure that part so that farmers, no matter where they are, here in Fairfield or Nebraska where we operate, in South Dakota where we have an operation with the natives in Pine Ridge or whether in Minnesota, they can access the same infrastructure no matter where in the country they are. That was central to making it available to all these farmers. The next big thing was to ensure that we have a standard um, so that the um, so that we watch over both the consumers so that we are not overpricing the products so that are still very affordable and on the other hand that the farmer has a decent livelihood and so this is calculated carefully the middle the uh, we tree range is a contract we do similar to new legacy uh, pork we we have the contracting processing distribution all of that but the tree range is being you know handed out in, in ownership to the farmers and to consumers if they want to participate and invest in the, in the in the brand the idea being that the ownership and control and as a result the financial benefits spread out what we say is we are not in the business we, we are in the business of making money yes everybody has to make money but it's not profit making it's called profit sharing like you said and so profit sharing is more important because if a farmer doesn't make a profit, doesn't mean they won't get a profit out of the system, even if they don't get a profit at the beginning when they sell the chicken or the pork or whatever. So that's the way we have structured these layers and layers of infrastructure that we have now put together so that as we go into new communities, we can bring the whole package and de-risk, in other words, the whole process by which farmers, consumers, and, in, and businesses in the middle can participate in the process. Follow-up question is: What can the people out here do to, to make it to help help advance this? And I know obviously they can buy these alternative products, but um, the, oftentimes there's sort of a certain amount of denial. I mean, frankly, if it doesn't say anything on the shelf, it's capable. I, you know, pork, chicken, eggs. If it doesn't specialize it on the label, some and le read the label carefully, it, it, it isn't. Um, it's just a commodity, capable stuff. Dean, did you want to? Maybe a little bit. I mean, that's, you know, going to ag conferences and also marketing um, oriented discussions in the, in the industry. The focus on the industry is going forward is to have credible claims and it's third party verification of your claims. And that's why these, you know, the claims that we're making, and most of you are familiar with non GMO verified project, project verified. Um, that's a third-party verification system. Um, the Global Animal Partnership that we're using is a third-party verification system. USD Organic is a third-party verification system. So even if you're not organic, these other, these other systems, these other labels are going to be more and more pre prevalent. Uh, for, for us right now, the, the gap, I mean, there's, there's so much going on in, in people's lives. I mean, who's going to keep track of all this stuff? But it's important for us because in the industry, they understand what it is and they know what it is. We're, there's, there's grocery chains that will talk to us because they know what the Global Animal Partnership is. It's, it's big in Whole Foods markets. They actually have their, their gap ratings on all their meat products now in most of their stores. 
um, and that's going to spread probably. Gap, there's a good chance that the GAP standards will become more prevalent. Uh, but uh, third-party verification, uh, look for the stickers, logos. I mean, those, those are things that uh, the farmers are being scrutinized for that, following those standards. Otherwise, you're, you're making claims that have absolutely no, they're unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated claims that mean absolutely nothing. It's natural. Good luck. So it's going to take wise consumers, just like wise farmers here, right, right? Um, maybe, John, it's getting late, we should take that five-minute break. I think so. Um, but people, you know, some people may need to go home, but uh, we're going to come back after about five minutes, and then you're going to be able to ask questions of the panel as well. So we'll have a short break, and then we'll resume with the panel with questions and audience. But I want to remind people that may be leaving or later on that uh, we have people handing out sheets when you leave that will tell you what you can do to make a difference. And so make sure that you pick up one of those sheets if you leave. And there's also a, a table outside where you can sign the petition for a statewide moratorium on CAFOs if you haven't already done so. So please stay around for the social hour also. We're going to have a social hour this year that's new after the panel discussion and we'll have uh, light snacks and a cash bar then, and you'll have an opportunity then to visit with the speakers individually at the social hour after we conclude the panel. So we're gonna take about five minutes here for those of you that do need to leave so that we don't have people just you know, leaving here and there, and then we'll be back in five minutes, and if you have questions from the audience, then we'll get those questions. We have microphones down in front. You can come up and ask questions of the panel from the audience as soon as we come back. I want to come up to see your farm. <laughs> yeah, there is, um, the, you, you can come partner with Scott and other folks that just brought a whole group of students. Um, in the past, we have met, I mean, uh, average 2,000 visitors a year, and now we have been very selective. Only partners can bring groups, so if Fairfield is a partner, you can bring as many groups as you want. Nice. All right, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, my questions. Pretty similar to kind of what Chris asked. Um, I'm a student of uh, Chris Johnson's uh, first farming program of Roa and Dean and Francis and all of these guys. And I came here more on like a plant-based diet and not really understanding the whole idea of animals needing to be involved in the whole system. So now that I've been around this, this these ideas for the last couple of years, it's, it's really making me want to get involved in it. So it's like, what are the steps that a student now or, or a farmer that wants to transition from conventional type things to get into what Reggie, Reggie's doing and what Dean's going to do of, of doing the, the animals and the perennial types of things and not just doing your annual farming that we kind of think is the way it's supposed to be done, like doing it holistically. So how, how can I take the next step to uh, be involved in this? Well, Kyle, out at the farm, I mean, we're implementing, trying to implement the system. Uh, we're exploring it with Rahe and partners in the community. So we have hazelnuts installed, and we'll be hopefully getting chickens onto the farm in one capacity or the other next year. Um, as to working with Dean, Dean? Yeah, and, and, and Chris can speak to this as well. Um, for a program like ours doing, doing um, natural pork production. Uh, for a new farmer, I would recommend them to intern, someone like the Chris here. Um, it, it, there's a lot to know. There's, there's generations worth of knowledge that you can glean from, from working with someone with experience. It's, it's, a little, it's a little too complicated. There's too much to learn and know to just try to wing it by yourself. So I would highly recommend um, volunteering. <laughs> Um, I'm sure if you, you farmers like Chris could use help all the time, or or, or actually get a job and intern at a farm, or or, or you know just even even get a job and, and, and spend some time working in, in the same environment. And certainly, if someone's interested in doing that with our program, we, we could set them up with a farmer. Yeah. I'm, I'm hard of hearing, so I am too. Oh, okay. <laughs> how to get Oh, how how to get started. Um, well, that, that depends on how much money you got, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Comments? 
sense. You start out small, figure out what works. You can read all the ag manuals in the world and keep track of what they say. Learn some, uh, leave some of it alone. I'm the type of guy I read the directions and I throw the book away. And I'll refer to it. But that's kind of the same way I got started farming. And, you know, I, I grew up on a farm, so I knew a lot. But, again, the old boys will tell you two things. And two things to be aware of when you start farming. Number one is bankers. And number two is scumps. I had an old boy say that a few years ago. And, but you gotta start small. You gotta know what you're doing. You gotta have a way to sell your product other than just do the commodity types. Uh, and years past, you know, a lot of years ago, yeah, that would work. Um, it really helped for a beginning farmer to have an off-farm job, unfortunately or the wife working full-time, that's the way we've done it for many years. Uh, it's, it's very hard work, very stressful at times, but some guys want to farm real bad, so. Okay, next question, please. <laughs> when we have these meetings, we're always talking to people who probably not farmers, mostly. And what did we say, even in Jefferson County, there's only 3% of the people who are farming. And I'm just trying to figure out how you can reach, or how we can all reach farmers who want to farm, but want an alternative and don't quite know. How, how you can approach these people or get to them so that it's not just you know, talking heads, people here talking to each other who think it's a great idea, but we're not really the people to implement it, you know. We can support it, but how to get to the farmers and how to help the farmers change what they're doing, I think that's a really big question. Yeah, thanks, so You know, living out in, in farm country, six miles north of the town for almost 20 years, I got to know a lot, of, a lot of farmers up there. And the thing is, you come to realize is that everybody knows everybody. And, they're, 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 and I don't mean this in any kind of derogatory way, but they're, they're, often, they're often related as well. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're cousins, they're extended family, they're, they're friends of they're relatives. And when you start having success with a program like this, in, in two or three years from now, if we have one farmer in, in this county that has a success, every farmer in this county will know about that success. It's really great to hear. So I serve as an advisor to the Savannah Institute out of Wisconsin, and in a recent exercise of farmer outreach, um, they just took a whole county, got all the, the addresses from the tax records, crafted a really nice introductory letter to agroforestry systems, called every farmer in there. The result was absolutely mind-blowing. They couldn't handle the response. So that was one way that is being done in one place. We want to replicate that everywhere we go now with our poultry and our agroforestry systems so that we can actually bring, once we have an institutional partner that can actually handle you know, moving the farmers into a new system and has the infrastructure, curriculum, and all of that, um, then we can reach out that way at a, a pretty large scale. As far as the other side of our equation, which is farmers who are really experienced, multi-generations like myself, but don't have land, and, and immigrant farmers uh, I'm talking about, um, what we did was we went through the churches. So for example, and this is something that can be replicated anywhere. We did it in Marshalltown. Uh, we also did it in, in Minnesota, uh, Owatonna, Faribault, Northfield, and Red Wing. We just went to the churches, went to the places where people frequent, and then we, called, we, we, we did this, this thing called call to meeting. In the old traditions, in, in the colonial systems in Latin America, the, um, the way you would call the community to a meeting was by bringing a drum to the corner and then beating it, everybody would come out of those houses, and then they would 
you know, display the call, and then they will read the call by the mayor or the king or whatever. And so we replicated that in the community in Minnesota, and we brought together almost 2,000 Latino families into the different places, and then we had the same meeting over and over and over. And to do that, we also brought other services that we knew the community needed, like lawyers and nurses and all of that, and, and then, you know, daycare and so on, and we did this at the churches, and it allowed us to actually establish ourselves within a very short period of time with a really good credibility to the point that up to now, you know, for the last six years, we had never had to do outreach because everybody knew from the beginning what we were doing and wanted to do, what we were gonna take. So those were two different ends of that same process. Very inspiring. Yeah. So in Jefferson County, where we are right now, um, and you, you know, Chris is starting to implement this model. Dean is implementing his model, but there's still farmers out there, like at these meetings we've just had with the supervisors, for example. We, you know, there'd be maybe 300 people who are against the CAFOs and maybe three or four farmers and maybe two of them were CAFO operators. And they felt like they were being all walked over. You know, I talked to them afterwards. They say, yeah, but we, no one listens to us. But the fact is that the law listens to them and supports their position. But if they could somehow hear, in this county, we need to do something, a concerted effort to, I guess as, as Chris and you develop your partnership here, then we can go to them and we can show them the possibilities because they must feel terrible when they have these outside operators coming and they sign these contracts that ties them up for the next, you know, decade or so. And it's, it, it's, it must be really, in some ways it's exciting because they feel like they have some place to go, but at the same time, it's difficult, so. Yeah, farmers aren't evil. And I may put a target on my head for saying this at this conference, but JFAN misses that every once in a while. Oh, no, no. No, 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 please let me finish. Yeah, no. Uh, farmers are doing the best they can with what they have. Exactly. They are trying to make a living just like everyone else. And, you know, maybe they've been led astray into a system that is not best for everyone, but they're doing the best they can. Exactly. So when everyone gets together and starts hating on CAFOs and kind of misses the human piece of the families behind them, it kind of pisses me off mm -hmm. uh, and makes me not want to talk to you or talk to them or they don't want to talk to you. That's the recipe for continuing the system, not talking to each other. You gotta, despite your differences, at least come to a table and be able to not thump and yell and scream. You have to have a discussion one way or the other. That's exactly what some of us, including, we're, we're going to be trying to create some um, forum where we can have five CAFO operators or farmers and five other kind of community members in a, in a um, what do we call it, a kind of a mediation, a talking session for, you know, two, three hours that's really guided or four hours so we can completely, um, they can understand each other because of course some of us really feel bad for these, these poor, these farmers who are, are trying to be, they want to be farmers, it's a way of life and yet the way of life that they're stuck with is not what farming should be, so. Yeah, and nothing sells it like success, and, and I think Dean has been pretty good at making friends with his local his neighbors, and, and they see that it works, and, and they want, want to do it. And uh, oftentimes, they'll, farmers don't want to listen to their neighbors. They want to, somebody from out of town, they'll listen to, you know, I speak a lot of conferences, and sometimes an expert is just another damn fool from 100 miles away, as they say. And so, so you, sometimes you need to bring somebody from outside to, 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 to convince local people. Next question, please. Okay, I have a chicken question and then a pig question. Uh, in the free range model for chickens, I see uh, from your diagrams and pictures, you have uh, wire fencing. Um, do you use any electricity? Um, and what do you do at night for predators? Do they all, meat chickens and egg chickens, go back into the coop? Um, and then my pig question is, uh, how many sows 
do you think a small farmer should start off with in order to become profitable? So the, the, the trimming system is actually designed for uh, almost every factor that affects the chicken. One, one of the things that the chickens are really scared of is open space. And that's because there's a lot of area predators, so hawks and eagles and so on. So the, the tree range, the, the trees in the, in the ranging system protect them from that part. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't lost one chicken to a hawk in over 350 flocks that we have raised. So it's, it's an absolutely perfect record for a free ranging system. The second thing is the fence. Um, no, we don't use electric wires or any of that. The fence is really uh, built there to, to keep the chicken within a certain area. After we tested for two years the maximum length that most of the chickens will roam. And it's also to keep a lot of the other animals that also want a chicken dinner out of the, of the space where they live. So most predators um, that want to eat the chickens don't come out during the day. And so in the night, they are protected in a really well-built shelter. Those shelters are actually checked inch by inch on the bottom, so not even mice or rats can easily get in there. Um, the, the rats would actually nibble at the chickens too, and so that's very important. The other thing is that um, there is a lot of management that is done around, so keeping the fences clean and all of that also deters a lot of the predators. Skunks and raccoons and coyotes, they are bonded around us. Uh, but they only come during the night. And during the night, they can also roam in the tree range system as well because there's nothing to eat there. But normally, they don't make it past the big fence on the outside and they just stay on the outside. Um, coyotes have never eaten a chicken. Uh, they actually, um, if a chicken is dumb enough to stay outside of the fence uh, and a coyote eats it, we never know because they don't leave anything. And that is actually a good thing. Um, so, what else did you ask? I think that covers it. Are you actually closing them in the coop or just allowing them to free range into the coop when they're ready? The, the chickens go into the coop, almost on the clock. All of them, all you do is close the door. Okay. And, uh, or the doors, because there's, depending on the size of the flock, there's many doors that they use to go out into the paddocks. And those doors are actually built so that they actually seal really well. And uh, so no, nothing can get in there. How many sows? He asked how many sows a beginner should, should, should think about having to start with. Yeah, let me, let me just do yeah. that real quick and then I'll give it to Chris. Um, for example, in my program we have um, two brothers, they're, they're Amish and they've been raised on farms. They know how to raise pigs very well um, and they're, they're, they're being very aggressive about this. They have the facilities, they have the infrastructure. Um, they have the know-how and they're doing a 150 sow program for them. I'm not worried about that um, if, if it was a beginning farmer who didn't have uh, any background raising hogs um, You know, I, I, I think what Chris said earlier the, you know start very small and, and, and learn what you're doing or else You know learn by working with, with someone who's already in the business. So it's, it's, there's no easy question It depends on your your, your capabilities your finances your, the infrastructure you have, your, your equipment, um, how much time you can dedicate to it, and your, and your knowledge base. So it's kind of a complicated formula. It just it's, it changes from individual to individual. Yeah, I, I believe for a uh, beginning farmer, a um, lot of knowledge is a key thing. And you know, I grew up on a traditional family farm, so you learn a lot. You don't know everything until you own it, and it's your game. Uh, a lot of surprises. Um, and like I said, it can be, you know, a, a tough life and a good life. And uh, there's, there's so many things you could talk about. Um, I guess just probably about it for me. And let me say, um, being an independent pig farmer, 
versus the industry. And a beginning farmer puts up a million dollar building, you know. There's not too much to that. If you don't, something breaks down, you call somebody, this and that. And what I've learned over the years, the KFO guy goes in, checks the feeding equipment and everything else, um, drives out any dead pigs, uh, etc. That's his chores. When you're a family farmer, it's every day, all day, viable things. And the difference between an independent pig farm and a corporate KFO is when I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, it starts. I go out and get that paper. When I poke my head out that door, if everything is quiet, it's going to be a good day, a better day, because the pigs are happy, they're comfortable, and everything else. With the KFO industry, the people that live by it, I hear it again and again and again. It's the noise, the feed trucks, the delivery trucks, the hogs hauling out or the trucks hauling out the pigs, the noise of the feeding equipment at night, the pigs squealing all night because they're crowded and uncomfortable. That's the difference, people. So, eating is spiritual. Know where your food comes from. Yeah. Okay, we need to uh, wind up. I think we'll probably need to get out of here in a few minutes, but. I want to thank the panel, Francis, uh, Ricky, uh, Chris, Dean, uh, and Chris. Uh, I don't know how much longer the bar will stay open, but if you can catch them out here at the social hour, you can ask them more questions outside. Just a reminder, we have people handing out sheets as you leave, uh, indicating how you can make a difference, so you make sure that you take one. Uh, there's also a table outside where you can sign the petition for the statewide moratorium on CAFOs if you haven't done so. And finally, there will be a legislative forum here tomorrow night in the Sondheim, Thursday, October the 25th at 7 p.m. So you can learn about the candidates for state representative and state senators and uh, get and remember to get out and vote on November the 6th if you haven't done so already. So thank you very much for coming here tonight. And remember that if anyone tells you there are no viable alternatives to capos, that is simply not true. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, uh, I didn't get back in there uh -huh. quick enough to, um, to notice if anybody else asked it. But um, what I found is that very often when thing, things like this, where we're trying to change a system that isn't working, um, uh, all the people that see that it's not working mm -hmm. are on the same team and, and um, they want people to be able to change just because the system is bad for the environment and whatever. And, and like the last gentleman said, Chris, Chris was saying, these are all people that are doing the best they can with the information they've been given. Right, right. Um, I found for a very long time that in a system that needs to be changed, you can't just say this one's a bad system. You need to show them something that gives them more. A different way to do something. You yeah, think, you know, but... You can't just the, lambast the, things. These systems that were presented today, uh, I, they, you threw some numbers around, but I couldn't, I didn't have any numbers on what the KFO, potential KFO owner looks at for potential profits in a range that might happen or might not happen. You know, like, I, I'm expecting that there are some KFO owners that really hit it big. And, they, and their, their equipment doesn't fail early and all the other things that can happen. And they actually make enough money that they can impress a friend that they sh I should go into it too. But I'm yeah, wondering, yeah. I, I believe in the concept of getting people to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. You know, when, when they haven't been convinced of the concept yet. If, if they get to see that the money is there to do it a way that's more environmentally, environmentally proper, um, then you can usually get them to take that kind of shift, even if they're not going to be altruistic enough to make sure that they're not polluting. But they'll do it because the model that you've shown them is going to make them a lot of money and, and 
give them other benefits. So are, are these all things that will give them less profit but more peace of mind, or are these things that could give them the same kind of profit? Well, I can't tell you whether they will make the same kind of profit or not. What I can tell you is that they will have way better livelihoods. And the reason is because the way the KFO system works is a very tight, very controlled, and very subsidized system. Mm -hmm. oh. If the subsidies stop, then it's this. What are you drinking? Um, Lagunitas, a uh, I'll take a Lagunita. Yeah. So what happens is that all of the all of the contract farming done for KFO folks, the brand new building always gets priority because they know that as the building gets older and the equipment gets older, the quality drops and all of that. So it's actually a pass-through system. And the whole subsidy is actually not as straightforward as you think. For example, the, the corn, the soybean and all of that is subsidized to the farmer who grew the corn, not the CAFO that is actually buying the grain to put it into, into feed for the farmer who's producing the hog. Yet it's already subsidized, right? Okay. The other thing is that you got on the other hand, on the other hand, you know, a few years after you get in, way, way before you have paid your debts and all of that, you become obsolete to the contract. So even if you think you made it for two or three or five, maybe six, seven years, you will get dropped and you will lose your shirt. That's the story continuously for most of the producers. So I want to know if anybody over the next, you know, somebody over 15, 20 years who has been a careful producer, actually has made any money at all. Well, because it sounds, even, like a very, sounds like it shouldn't be a rhetorical question. It should be something that somebody has researched. Well, here's the thing. If you, if you, if you want to get to the bottom of it, read a book, it's called Meat Racket. And Meat Racket, Christopher Leonard, actually outlines exactly what I'm saying with facts and all of that. So we are definitely a better option for farmers from a profitability perspective, from an environmental perspective from a consciousness perspective, all of that, we are a better option because we are permanent. So you need we are to not building a system that puts people through on the other end once they are used, well, not, not used up and extracted all of the resources great. they have. You know? all right, so, that's what so we can say. I'm you know? sold, but the person that's shopping for which type of farm they're going to do, are they still going to be sucked into the whole CAFO thing because of some empty promise? Listen, here's what we need to do. Ignorance is what sucks people into those things. Yeah. And, and then sometimes it's just plain green. I was in Guatemala, you know, traveling through a rural area. I was with some elders from the community, very food secure community, good quality foods, they grow it all in there. And yet one of those fellows tells me on the way out, you know, points to this monoculture, you know, field next to us in the car and says, you see, that's what we want to do. How do we do that? I had no idea what they had in their community. And so we sat down at the end of that trip, you know, a few minutes later, and I had him evaluate the wealth they had versus the, the, the racket that they wanted, they were aspiring to. And once they understood that, like, yeah, no way we're going to do that. Well, that's what I'm you saying. Know. It's so, education. It's education. But, but you know. have to get somebody to, uh, um, to get them to understand. We have to do that. There is no way to get educated without doing the work. That's definitely not going to happen. So, and there are farmers who simply don't are not interested in this kind of work we do, and we are not asking them to be part of it. It's all it's all voluntary. This is only for people who want to change, who want to do something different, who want to think long term and short term, but without compromising the long term. And there is so many farmers who want to do that that. Somebody who wants to do a cave is going to go ahead and try to do a cave. We're not getting yeah, in the way. But they're doing that with misinformation, is all I'm saying. Yes, but it is their job to inform themselves. I mean, we got a responsibility to put the facts in front of everybody who asks us. Yeah. But we got no responsibility to go shopping and to go and, and try to convince anybody. I'm not in the business of convincing anybody. And we don't have to because there's plenty of people coming to us who already want an alternative and are willing to... Well, that's true. That is, that is the best scenario. Yeah, exactly. And the more people that notice your success and get into it that way, the more likely the others are going yeah, to hear that, that more, that's, maybe I didn't get into it. Yeah, that's how we are spreading. That's how we are spreading and there's still going to be farmers who are going to make mistakes. If, okay. some, if somebody did get into it and they're five years into their KFO already, um, 
are the these financing arms and these real, real estate arms that you know that uh, was it Dean talking about? Yeah. Um, are are they set up that they can help somebody make the transition? There is the, our partnership with Iroquois Valley Farms. It's actually to transition farms. Yeah. That's one partnership we have in place. Great. Now. Right now, we want transition anybody because we got plenty of new farmers who can do it right from the start. Right. That's the thing. Right now, we are market driven too. You know, we are not here for we're not do gooders. We don't do this for 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 altruistic reasons. This is a business we're running. Yeah. So if the farmer wants to be in business with us, we're ready. That's that's the key. Thank you for that.